Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're returning to the topic of the Psalms and their meaning. Now, a brief disclaimer before getting into this psalm. The Psalms will be numbered differently in different translations of the Bible. This is a very, very old discrepancy, and to help clear things up, I'll be explaining what number the Psalm has in the Dewey Rheims Bible and in the Revised Standard Version. However, the episodes themselves will list Psalm numbers as they're given in the Dewey Rheims Bible. Sorry if this is confusing. Anyway, this is Psalm 49 in the Dewey Rheims Bible, but Psalm 50 in the RSV. A Psalm for Asaph. Asaph was one of the head musicians of King David, who was appointed as the chief Levite to minister before the Ark of the Covenant in 1 Chronicles 16, 4-5. The phrasing is ambiguous, but it seems that Asaph either wrote this psalm, or else it was written with the intention of him using it. The God of gods, the Lord, hath spoken, and he hath called the earth, from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof, out of Sion, the loveliness of his beauty. Called the earth means that God called the earth into existence, every part of it, from one horizon to the other, and since we know the world is round now, every spot on the globe was brought into existence by God. Beauty also comes from God, and shines out from the place where he lives, which Mount Zion is here being used to symbolize. God shall come manifestly, our God shall come, and shall not keep silence. A fire shall burn before him, and a mighty tempest shall be round about him. He shall call heaven from above, and the earth, to judge his people. Although God often makes his voice quiet and difficult to hear, as he did for Elijah, at times he can make his power felt quite forcefully, as he did during the time of Moses. Gather ye together his saints to him, who set his covenant before sacrifices. Those who follow God value his covenant with Israel, and perform the required sacrifices to fulfill their part in that covenant. This may also imply that the sacrifices themselves have less value than the covenant, something that would become much clearer in New Testament times. And the heaven shall declare his justice, for God is judge. God judges people with perfect justice, which is made obvious by the remarkable order of the natural world. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify to thee. I am God, thy God. The speaker of this part of the psalm is now God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices, and thy burnt offerings are always in my sight. I will not take calves out of thy house, nor he-goats out of thy flocks. For all the beasts of the world are mine, the cattle on the hills and the oxen. I know all the fowls of the air, and with me is the beauty of the field. God approves of the willing sacrifices made to him by his people, and recognizes the value in these animals being willingly offered to him, for this reason and many others, he has no intention of trying to take them by force. After all, he can have all the animals he wants. He created them all. If I should be hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Shall I eat the flesh of bullocks, or shall I drink the blood of goats? God needs no human assistance in satisfying any hunger on his part. He doesn't experience hunger or need in the sense that we think of them, and even if he ever did, our help wouldn't be needed to satisfy it. Offer to God the sacrifice of praise, and pay thy vows to the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. God says that what we should really do is honor and praise him, since there isn't anything more perfect to adore, keep our promises to him, and request his help when we need it. But to the sinner God hath said, Why dost thou declare my justices, and take my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hast hated discipline? and has cast my words behind thee. Every person who praises God, with very few exceptions, is also guilty of at least some sin, but this accusation isn't meant to be leveled against all of them. Here, we have a message meant for those who pay lip service to God and his greatness, but who stubbornly refuse to fight against their own personal temptations, or turn their backs on the sins they've wrestled with. Instead of trying to accept God's teaching and learn how to find fulfillment in avoiding evil, they instead use praise to God to try to disguise their evil doing, or in some cases, try to justify doing evil by twisting God's words. If thou didst see a thief, thou didst run with him, and with adulterers thou hast been a partaker. The people that God is leveling this at are those who participate in evil actions that others are committing. Thy mouth hath abounded with evil, and thy tongue framed deceits. They also lie and deceive, abusing their ability to communicate. 
Sitting thou didst speak against thy brother, and didst lay a scandal against thy mother's son. They deliberately caused discord within their families by leveling accusations against their family members and accusing them of shameful behavior. These things hast thou done, and I was silent. Thou thoughtest unjustly that I should be like to thee, but I will reprove thee and set before thy face. A lot of people think of their sins as no big deal, something that's easily overlooked. But while other people may ignore certain kinds of sins because they are sinners too, God isn't. God knows what was really going on in our hearts when we committed those sins, and he knows whether we were trying to resist evil temptations or not. He is forgiving, yes, if we ask for forgiveness, but we should never think that God sees sin as no big deal. Understand these things, you that forget God, lest he snatch you away and there be none to deliver you. If we screw up our relationship with God, nobody else can fix that for us. Our fate in relation to God is the most important thing for us, and we need to do our best to get that right, or nobody else will be able to save us. The sacrifice of praise shall glorify me, and there is the way by which I will shew him the salvation of God. By praising God correctly and doing our best to avoid sin and evil while doing good, we can accept his guidance on the path toward salvation, guidance that we sorely need. This is a psalm about our relationship with God the way we should behave towards God, the value of praise over sacrifices, the need to pursue personal holiness, and the fact that salvation, in the end, is a magnanimous gift of God, which we can reject by ignoring our relationship with him. We also see here a balance between the incredible holiness and purity of God and his willingness to save and forgive while still seeking our involvement in the pursuit of holiness for ourselves as far as we can. There's a lot to this psalm. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.